Hi, everyone. Hi. Yay. How are you? Great. Awesome. How's DevOps so far? Good? I just came. I don't know. Let me know if it's fun or not. Hopefully, we'll have some fun tonight. Today, it's three, right? Something like that. So, I'm Brit Barak. Um, I came all the way from Israel. I'm an Android developer, and I've been leading uh, mobile teams in Israel in a few startups uh, that I'll tell you about those in a little bit. Uh, I'm also leading Android Academy TLV community, which is um, totally voluntarily a uh, big community for, uh, for Android developers and designers. You can look us up uh, and meet up or Facebook. And I'm also leading women tech makers in Israel. So if you're in Israel, just let me know. I know all kind of cool meetups to go to. So just let me know. Um, I want to hear a little bit, though, before we begin, about you guys. Um, who, it's not working. So I want to hear about you a little bit. Um, who's here a developer? Huh? Yay. Uh, who is an Android developer? OK, like half. OK, good. I wanted to know. Um, who is working for startup, very small startup? OK, and for a very big company? So the rest, I guess, in, is in the middle? Yeah? OK, good. Just wanted to know who am I talking to. So um, oh, this is working now. Good. So uh, like I tell you, I've been working in a few startups team, like in a very core team, from scratch to growth. Um, and one thing that I've learned is that there is one thing that is always certain when we're talking about small startups. When everything is changes, the product changes, the design changes all the time, um, the, the priorities changes, sometimes the business even changes, one thing is always, always, always certain. And that is that everything is going to change. And it's going to change really, really, really quick. Therefore, our architecture, our app, our code base should support that all the time. Um, and we're going to take a look a little bit of my experiences and how to do it. Um, before that, I want to share with you some small story about my first startup, I guess. Uh, it happened when I was in high school. I grew up, like I told you, in Israel, in a very small and new town. And one of, I guess, my first startup was um, that me and my high school uh, peers decided that we want to major in high school in theater. So we had to establish the theater class, which was something that never existed. And it was all about going and finding the teachers and budgets, of course, and classes and costumes. It was really, really, really fun. And then we had some uh, shows and plays that uh, we had so we can earn some money uh, and buy some more stuff. So this is kind of my first startup. Um, the thing that I really loved about it, about the creation and everything, uh, was amazing. But a guy that inspired me the most was my favorite playwright. Do you maybe recognize this person? Yeah? No? It is Shakespeare. This is William Shakespeare, guys. So William Shakespeare was, was my favorite playwright. Um, and my fav one of my favorite plays was uh, is called uh, As You Like It. It's a very good play. If you haven't uh, read it, I really encourage you to do that. So there is a very famous quote from there, hopefully you know it, where uh, is a monologue, and it says that all world's a stage, and all men and women are merely players. They have their exits, they have their entrances, and one man at his, at his time plays many parts. And then it's a really beautiful monologue, and then uh, it describes like the parts, the seven steps in a man's life. Um, it's very nice. You should read it if you haven't. Well, for me, this was kind of inspiring for uh, the code that I wrote later on. Why did I? What did I love about it, or what makes sense for me? Is first of all, we're talking about players. So for me, each class that I wrote, 
is like a player that I want to understand what's, uh, what's its part in the play, what it's here to do. Uh, second thing, we're talking about exits and entrances, which is like defined interfaces. For each class, I have to know who is going to use it, how is it going to be used, um, and so on. And also about the playing parts thing. So the playing parts, meaning that each person or each class has a part, a specific part, each time on his life, um, or on the app, of course, when uh, we're talking about our code. And uh, this is kind of like the separation of concerns. I want each class to be in charge basically about a specific thing. So this is kind of gave me some inspiration that I wanted to share with you today. Um, but let's talk um, about the app that I want to show you a little bit that I wrote. So just before that, I mean, we are pretty close by now. I told you a lot of stories about my life. And I want to kind of ask you another question. Um, so, sorry. So um, before I'm going to ask you this personal question, just want to say that uh, our goals when we create the apps is not about writing a beautiful architecture or creating this classes, these beautiful classes. It is about first write quicker code, right? To make all the changes that we talked about, like really, really quick. But we have to write a code that would be easy to change and to maintain, and then we can rely on, so it's easy to test. And is it to understand? I say it has to be easy to understand by others, because if we wrote the code ourselves, it's, well, it's easy for us to understand. We wrote it, so um, it, it makes sense that we can understand it. The goal is for others to understand it really well. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you today about is kind of how I uh, create or how I think about the architecture for uh, the app that will help us uh, achieve the goals that we just said. Um, we're going to talk about the architecture. Luckily for us, uh, Android very recently, on recent Google I.O., um, announced on a very cool project, which is the architecture component. Who have heard about it? Just so I know. OK, so um, the, the thing is that developers um, from the community kind of gave the, the notes that we need some help with realizing what's the right way to architect our, uh, our apps. So there are a few things that Google did for us. And actually, it was done very closely with the community. I was um, a part of the uh, uh, early access program for this thing. So it's been very great that we can uh, actually give some best practices and give back and, and forth with, the, with this amazing project. So there are two parts for this project of the new architecture components. One is actually giving us architecture components, like objects in the framework that are supported by the framework and can help us. We're going to actually see how to use them and to work with them. But it's not the main point. The main point is kind of understand what are the best practices for the architecture, like logically. Um, and we're going to use the new architecture component, but the thing is kind of understand the uh, mindset. Uh, and luckily for us, like a few days ago, uh, it actually became stable and official, so uh, we can all feel very comfortable in using them also in production, which is awesome. So the personal question I wanted to ask you guys is who of you loves jelly beans? Not too many, I don't believe that. Well, I for one love jelly beans. I really, really love them. And there is a small secret about jelly beans that not everyone knows, just the expert one, is that um, instead of eating them just like that, one by one, you can actually create recipes. And then if you make the right combinations, instead of eating jelly beans flav with flavors, you actually eat jelly beans, which tastes like, which tastes like dessert 
very cool desserts. So this is kind of very, very, very cool, and I really wanted to create an app that um, can allow me to see them and to create them uh, when I do that. So my app, of course, can help me understand that if, for example, I take two green apple um, jelly beans and one cinnamon, it's going to taste like apple pie. Try it at home. It's very really good. Um, and of course, I'm going to have the list of jelly beans that I can see all of them that I can create the, the recipes with, and a jelly bean uh, activity or screen to add a new one or to add it the older ones. This is the kind of the app that I created. Um, and I want us to take a look a little bit on how to do it or where to start when I have this kind of idea, how can I l look at the app and understand what's the, um, what's the different um, components that I'm going to use. So the way I like to look at the app and to think about the app is something like that. So we're going to talk about each of them uh, a little bit deeper um, in a few minutes. In general, I have three layers, not too many, just three layers. The presentation layer is about the views, about the UI, about how things are looking for the users. We have, um, on the other hand, the data layer, which is very objective. It's about the data uh, entities and the way that w they are represented on different servers or on our database and so on. And then we have the domain layer to just be uh, the intermediate between them and have our uh, app logics and actually all the things, all the use cases that we do with the app, get users, get Jellybean and so on, they'll be all on the domain layer. So let's consider this screen to create a new Jellybean. What do I have on the screen? I have the user, the flavor name that the user can type in and I have three sick bars. Each of them is for the R, G and B of the jelly bean color, so when I change them, it automatically, like straight ahead, changes the color on the top. So let's think about how we want to create those. First thing is the presentation layer. Its job, its role, its part is about the UI. It is not at all about any logic. So it's kind of a Johnny Bravo person that is like all about the look. It doesn't want to think a lot, okay? So to create that and to make it even easier for the UI, for the presentation layer, I don't want it to be thinking at all. I'm going to create a, an object. I call it a view model because it's here to serve the view. Anything the view needs in the, and to make it very easy for the view, as easy as possible for the view, I'm going to create the fields for it. Um, and then it would be able to, the view would be able to use it as easy and as quick as possible. So we created this view model since it serves the view. And then on my own create, basically what I want to do is uh, set the view model for the view and then to set all the other things on the UI. So the set view model currently, what it does, it just create a new view model. Why? Because this is a new jelly bean that we're creating. So it's a new object, it's currently like, empty with any data. And the thing that we have to remember always that the point is that the UI represents the view model state, right? Not the other way around. So currently the view model is empty, therefore the UI is empty. Awesome. Basically I would want to create this as the presentation layer has the view, the layout, right? And then it has also the view model. And now when the user ha gives us any kind of input, for example here he just moves around the, uh, the sick bars for the colors, the view is going to know about it, obviously, because he uh, had the inputs. What, well, you're going? Why? Didn't like the jelly beans, I'm guessing. So uh, the, view mo the view is going to let the view model know that something has happened, but the view model is going to have to change its state and then to notify the view about the changes. All right, we'll see how it's going to happen. So first step, we have to update the view model. Here. 
just for example, uh, we're talking about the sick bar. So when the sick bar changes, we're going to grab the progress. So it's where we're at, which new value did we get? And the view model um, is going to set the R field with the new progress. S that's it. The view model then has to notify about the change. How do we do that? There are many ways that we can use. We have just a plain callback, don't do it, but we can use that. Uh, we have the data binding, we have the Rx Java, which is like kind of hip right now. But what we're going to talk about actually is the live data. What is the live data? It's a new ob object or component from the architecture components that we talked about. And what it does, it just holds some kind of a data, whatever we want, and it allows other classes to register to it and when it changes when the value is changes um, it's going to notify everyone so yeah it's kind of observable observables kind of like rx java but the thing here is that it's life cycle aware this means that automatically without us needing to do anything it would only get the notif the updates when the life cycle is started or resumed and it would remove itself when the lifecycle is destroyed. It does it automatically. If I used Arc Java, I should have done that myself. This thing helps us a lot, mainly with memory leaks that we don't have them anymore um, if we're using that. So that's a great, great advantage. What do we do? Instead of just having ints at this instance, we're going to wrap them up with live data objects. And then, when we're going to set the R value, we just have to, we can validate it. It's just something that I uh, created because I wanted to make sure that this value I accepted is between 0 and, uh, and 255. And then I'm going to set value for the R, which is the live data. Once I set the value, everyone who observes this R value is going to be notified about the change. Awesome. So now what we need to do is, well, create the observer, create the one who's going to listen to the changes, right? How do we do it? We have the observer. It's the observer from the lifecycle component. It's an Android component. Um, and I create just the observer. Whenever there is a change, I'm going to be notified here. And I can change the bin uh, image view color. That's it. Very, very simple. So next thing uh, we have to do is just observe the view model changes. So I have the view model, and I set the uh, observer to listen to the R, right? To the R uh, field. This is what we want to do. The thing is that we have to notice here is that on the observer, a part of the observer, we have this. This is for the lifecycle owner. Lifecycle owner is also a new thing, um, and it it has um, it's something that an activity or a fragment or whoever who has a uh, uh, lifecycle in it has has it, right? It implements it. It's an interface. So since we attach the observer to the, uh, to the um, uh, life cycle. All the things that I told you before, all the magic uh, just happens. And it just, uh, for example, uh, will we'll stop listening whenever uh, the life cycle ends. That's great. So we just saw the input changes, the notifies the view. The view sets a new value to the view model. The view model notifies to everyone who observes it. And then the view, the view itself changes. Here we change the color. Awesome. Now, a small thing that we have to consider when we're talking about Android or applications and, and um, platforms with like lifecycle is about the persistence of the view model. Why? Because we have this kind of a thing when we, s when we have uh, uh, our app or our activity uh, active or started, when we switch the configuration, when we have a configuration change, here, for example, I um, rotated the screen, then the activity just uh, creates itself from, from scratch. And this means changes that we made are deleted. 
So in order to support that, we actually have to save the state and then um, to save the state of the view model. And then when it's recreated, we have to like take the view model back again and to fill the field. So here with the new component, there is something that can really, really help us with that re really easily. So when we set the view model, I have the view model providers class, which actually saves the view model states for me per um, life cycle. You see again that this, this is per life cycle owner. And then I can just get the view model, get the jelly bean with the state and persist it and, and set the UI like, uh, like it was before the change. So this makes it very, very easy for us. Now, what about if I have some more complex view models? This happens sometimes. What I have to say about that is just don't be afraid to create multiple view models uh, and multiple live data objects, then just have them binded into one object, one view model that uh, would actually talk with a UI that would have uh, all, all the other uh, view models with it. And then, um, and then it would be very easy for you, like you separate to any other classes when you have too much logic or too much um, uh, data there. Just separate them. Just make sure they are lifecycle aware and they are like view models uh, like we saw before. So we created the UI and everything. Now let's save the jelly bean. Right? We want to save it on our, uh, on our storage. Here comes the data layer into action. So data layer is all about the objective. I call it objective data because um, it represents the actual state of the data, whether it's on a network uh, service. We maybe have like, different APIs that we're dealing with. So we don't know how is it going to look like, and it doesn't. no one in the application has to care except of the data layer. It is not about caring about how the consumer would use this, use the data, how does the UI is going to use the data. It doesn't care about this at all. And the way we're going to do it is to have two specific entities. So it's all about rules and books. We have two kinds of entities. One is the data model that we're going to see in a minute, uh, which is the entities of the data. And then we have repositories that we'll see in a bit. Well, the model is just, like I said, the way it is on the servers, on the um, databases, or whatever. We don't control it at all, but we need to have an, mod an object, a model of it, a POJO, of course, on our app so we can, uh, so we can use that. Just to um, just to make sure, this is the view models that we saw before. They are not the same. It's a totally different object. Like I said, the UI doesn't care and doesn't know about the representation of the data in the in the data layer in the um, in the servers or or the services. So this is kind of about that. Now the repositories that I mentioned before, we have one repository pair this data type. So here, for example, it's the jelly bean repository that we're going to use, but we're going to have a recipe different repository. We're going to have users repositories, I guess. So each data entity, data model, gets a separate repository. Its goal is to encapsulate the logic, meaning how we get or set or save the data. Um, no one should know about this except of the specific repository. We'll see in a second um, how it works. And all the crude operation, the create, update, uh, read, and delete, are going to be done here on the repository. So for example, the Jelly Bean repositories, and I'm going to show you why this is a good pattern that I love to use, is um, what we're going to do here is, for example, we're going to get Jelly Bean by ID. This is just an example. The way it's going to work, for example, uh, for me, I just needed you know, a POC. I just did this app uh, from scratch, and I wanted to do it like, really quick. So I s decided to use a Firebase client. So I don't need a server right now. I just want to show that I can do whatever I want to do. So currently, I'm just using the Firebase, cl the Firebase client that I created. But then I want to make things 
better and, and more efficient. So I add a cache. Who knows about this change? Only this class, only the repository. Now I wanted to add an app database, a local database. I can do it, and only I know about it, only the repository. And then if I changed from Firebase to my servers, uh, um, uh, my servers, so I have another API client, who knows about it? Only the repository. So this is kind of something that I really like to use for this uh, reason. So we have the presentation layer with the view models, because it serves the view like we saw before, and now we saw the data layer with data models, but they are totally, completely different, right? So this is kind of frustrating, like how can I make the connection between them? So for that, I'm sure you'll remember, we have another layer, which is the domain layer. The domain layer has interactors, and that's their job to make the connections and the conversions between the different data models. All of the logic of the conversion is here, meaning all of the use cases, all of the app business logic, and what we want to do in the app is here with the interactors and the use cases. So it's kind of, if you remember Angelica from uh, Rugrats that could have spoken the, uh, the baby's language and also the adult, adult language, this is exactly that. A person who can speak with both of the layers, but that's only what it does. So let's save the jelly bean. How can we do it? First of all, we're going to create a use case. For each of the features, let's call it that, or the tasks that I want to do in my app, I'm going to create a separate use case for them. So here I have this save jelly bean use case. It's what it's going to do is just to execute. Execute the save jelly bean so it's pretty easy to understand. What it's going to do is to convert between the models, right? I'm going to get the view model that I just created and updated from the view from the presentation and then I need to convert it. How do I do it? It's very very simple in this case. Um, here for example what I, want, what I mainly need to do is to switch between the uh, three ints that I had for color. I need to prepare uh, a string with them so I can save it on the data layer. So that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to ask the repository to do it for me because the use case doesn't do it at all, but it knows all the repositories. So we give the repository the data for the save uh, bean uh, operation. And that's it. And then we just need to execute it, and it's all going to happen. So this is kind of how we create the, um, the uh, interaction between both of the layer. What did we have so far? The presentation layer has this view, and the domain layer has uh, the use case for the save jelly bean. We're going to execute it on the data layer. We're going to ask to do the actual saving. And the presentation doesn't really know where is it going to save, when is it going to be saved, how, even if, maybe the repository decides to throw it away. We don't, we, we don't really care. Each one has their own part to play. So another good thing about the, uh, the interactors, that this helps us with all the changes that we're doing, is uh, that the fact that we can reuse them. For example, here, um, let's say I want to create the edit screen. It can look completely different than the new, add new jelly bean screen. So it looks differently, but the operation at the end is the same to save, right? Um, so we can actually use the interactor, just use a different UI. All right. So a little bit more about the repository and how does that work, or the domain layer, actually. So the domain layer has a use case. Usually, what we love to do is to create a cache, maybe. Sometimes it's needed, sometimes it's not dependent um, performance, mainly. And then we want to save everything to the local database. And then if we need to, we're going to sync with, uh, uh, with servers with network services. But the thing is, we always want to have this local database that we're talking to and with. So it is like one source of truth. And all the data is saved there with the state uh, that is like the real truth that we want to use. 
Um, the way to do it is uh, a very cool way that uh, the way to do it is basically with SQL uh, um, databases. But now with the new component, we have uh, something that is called Room. And this is kind of a wrapper for the SQL uh, databases that we already have and know and know how to use, but it's very, very complicated. And it gives us many um, actually advantages. So first, it generates a lot of boilerplate code. I don't know if you've, uh, the Android developers here probably have, uh, but cre to create the SQLite database and the helpers and everything, it has to do with a lot, a lot of code. So uh, this does it for us. Also, this is uh, the first time that our queries, our SQL queries, are being uh, verified at compile time. If we do something that is all wrong, um, we can know it before before any crashes and everything. And also, it helps us to avoid calls, um, I mean, database calls on the UI thread. This is something we never want to do, of course, because the databases is something that is heavy to call from and to. So uh, it helps us on compile time to, uh, to, avoid that, to avoid that. So how do we going to use Room? First of all, that we need to do, what we need to do is to create the entities meaning the databases, the tables that we want to save. So we just annotate a class, a podio, uh, with an entity annotation. And this means that we're this is going to be saved in a separate uh, table. Um, and basically, that's it. We don't need to do much more than that. Only thing is, we have to have a primary one primary key, which has to be not null. We have to take care of that. But a part of it, we can save basically anything we want like that, and it would be saved on a, on a separate uh, table. Next thing we would need to do is to create a, a, a DAO, is a data access object. And this is how we're going to access this specific table. All right, so for this in instance, we're creating a Jelly Bean DAO. We have the annotation on the top, so we know this is a DAO. And then here, we can just create all the operations that we need to do and we want to do and to allow on the database, um, in just to have them here on the, on the DAO. Very simple. So we have the queries for, um, to, to sorry, we have the annotations for the queries, for example. We have inserts, we have delete. Everything uh, is, is really simple, and it just generates all the SQL code for us. So after we do, sorry, after we do that, we create an app database instance. This is just the database uh, that we have to define. We just need to define here uh, the version, which entities are we going to save here, some init and destroyed code that is not very much um, uh, interesting, so I didn't put it here uh, for this context. Um, but this is what we need to do. And then for each DAO that we create, so for each table that we create, we're going to have the DAO here as a public field. So each one who needs to uh, ask something in the database, we do it through the DAO. So after we created the, the database instance, we just have to use it from the repository. Only the repositories know about the database. This is something that is really important. And like I said, it's not just goes directly to the database. It asks the, uh, the DAO, the model, to do all the operations that we had before uh, on the interface. This is... Um, this is very simple. This is quite cool, isn't it? Another thing that, uh, that I do want us to notice right now is that when I return the um, whatever I wanted to do, for example, here, the get jelly bean, I do not return the data objects themselves. So I return them wrapped into a live data. And that way, whenever they return, it's going to be the same communication as we did with the presentation layer. So anytime it returns and has a new uh, uh, data in it, the use case is going to take it and do whatever it wants, all the conversions. Um, it, it's going to work quite the same with notifications. So we have the presentation layer. Um, 
that we saw before. We have the domain layer with the saved jelly bean, and then we have the data layer. What do we have there? We have the jelly bean repository. We ask it to save. It actually goes uh, to the local database and the, actually there to the DAO, and then it returns us everything that we need. So, the presentation layer, like we said, has the views, the view models, and uh, sometimes pre presenters, depends on how you want it to uh, implement it. The domain layer has all kinds of interactor and specifically use cases that we talked about here. Data layer is built of repositories and data models. So, what we saw here that um, if you're, if you're going to use the, uh, this structure or this ar architecture uh, that, I, that I showed you before, hopefully, and actually I can promise you that all these players and the access and the entrance and the plays uh, and the parts that they play are going to be very, very well defined. So this means that all these principles that we're uh, really trying to, to have on our app is going to be resolved for you. And of course, like we said, the point is to have a code that we can write quickly, we can change easily, like we saw. Um, it's very easy to change when we know um, each, uh, each um, uh, sorry, object, what it, the part it's playing. Uh, and we can test it very, very simple because each one of them has a very specific logic or no logic at all. Uh, and since we have this kind of architecture that we all understand which, who needs to do what, then it's easier for others on our team to understand it. Um, that's it for now. I have uh, some Medium posts about this, uh, what we talked about so far that are like notes for um, this, this kind of lecture and to, for, um, uh, with code examples, so you can check them out. Um, and a part of this, thank you so much. I'm here for questions or anything here or later. <laughs> we have a little bit of time for questions if you want to ask something. No? Um, this is, I mean, this is kind of how we uh, we use the. Okay, so the question: Why was the the data access object or uh, abstract class? This is kind of what allows the framework to do a lot of stuff in our behalf, um, and it generates a lot of code that you can actually see. I mean, if you look at the code that is generated on compile time, you can see all this code that is generated for us. Um, so this is uh, basically it. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, would it make sense to use a, a view model uh, for another view? Like not to connect the view to a view model, but to have different uh, views for uh, uh, the same view model? OK, so the question is if we can uh, use reuse a view model for different kind of views. Basically, I think that if you have views that, uh, that look quite the same, it can make sense. I mean, we want if if this is something we want to use that I don't think you should write that again. The thing is that the view model should always be there for the view itself. So if the views are different, just don't bother to use the same view model. Um, basically, if there's a different fields that you need or different uh, logic there, you just create a, a new view model. Um, it would help you like not to be confused later on because you might um f it is uh, well the different thing about the presenter is that it knows a lot more the presenter on MVP, uh, it knows a lot more. It has to know uh, the view. It has some logic in it, and so on. Here, the view model is just for it. Just knows the view, and it em emits changes. So it's a different kind of model. It's it's like kind of MVVM. It's more like that. Uh, so it emits changes. It, le it knows less about um, about anything. 
if it makes sense. Any more questions? All right, so thank you so much. I'm here if you want to ask me um, uh, later on. And thank you so much. Had a great time with you.